designing a hedgerow for yourselves. And so to talk with people in a similar microclimate than you, with you, makes for a more productive time. Um, how many people here are from an arid environment? Anyone? I'm sure that's not the case, but we never know. I don't want to leave anyone out. A, a maritime environment, meaning kind of more coastal. And then the temperate environment, which is this environment oh, here. So, the temperate. so I think temperate is probably going to be the yeah. biggest group. And you might just want to cluster with, with your group. And that the other thing that you're going to have is you're going to have a piece of graph paper. So this is a real how-to kind of um, class. Not only are we going to be showing slides, but we're also going to be um, thinking about your particular place where you might want to have a hedgerow. If you don't have a place where you have a hedgerow, then just take in all that information that you find useful. So grab a piece of paper, um, and we're going to start probably in five minutes or so. And I also have a few pencils here. probably for 35 years teaching, practicing, and enjoying constantly learning. Uh, and so I'm going to frame this talk a bit around permaculture in general as an introduction, and then move into, of course, the specifics of how do you create or co-create a multifunctional uh, hedgerow. So we'll start with um, this graphic that I put together, and I call it my, I just call it a permaculture spiral, element spiral. And so you see all the elements that we have in the permaculture design methodology and um, the elements. So how do you define permaculture? How many of you have been able to successfully define permaculture to your aunt, your mother, somebody who doesn't know anything about permaculture? Okay, so what do you say? What is your, what's your buzz? I, I tell people that permaculture is about creating systems for, for human living that mimic the abundance and the fertility and the stability of natural systems. And do they get it when you say that? They kind of go, huh. Uh -huh. That's <laughs> so one of the chores that I like to invite people to do is think about how can you define this term so that, like for the elevator speech kind of thing, um, you know, I used to say, and I still sort of say, depending on who I'm talking with, that permaculture is a new buzzword for an old way of thinking. Think about how our ancestors lived. They were local. They used, you know, this, so I kind of launch on that. And I'll also use the word permaculture as a design method to help with the, uh, for, to help create a more sustainable future. Because most people at this point know what sustainable means. And so some people don't like that word because it's maybe greenwash. So I invite you to think about how you would like to use that term. So I think of permaculture as a decision-making tool that helps create a more permanent culture. And it is based on whole systems design. So I'm starting this talk, even though we're focusing on hedgerows, just to be guiding you in the process of whole systems thinking, and that when we are designing anything, pretty much, we, you know, we start with a design, we think about the water and the relationship of the design to water, um, and how that impacts the soil, the animals, plants, forests, appropriate technology, structures, economics, and community. And really, in a hedgerow, you can consider all of these elements. There might be more of a focus on economics, or there might be a focus on community. There's always a focus on design, water, soil, plants. So I just wanted to give you um, a little introduction on that. It, and um, it's all about interconnecting relationships. So I um, offered you a handout. This is something that 
I came to that I give to all my introductory classes and all the classes that I teach. Um, I mostly now teach. I've taught permaculture design courses for years, and now I focus on an advanced course in teaching how to teach people to, uh, to teach permaculture, basically in any kind of environment. So, um, and so this is a sampler of, um, for me, the way I look at the permaculture principles, not just. David Holmgren's, but Bill Mollison's, and the combination of both of them. So what is permaculture goals, and then there's the resources, and then on the back is the ethics and principles. So that's there more just, of those handouts? Yes, there are. One of the things that I do invite you to do is to ask questions. So any question on anything, I honor, as well as if I'm going to get to the answer to that question, I'll let you know. Okay, um, so the first thing I'd like for you to do is, I'm curious, how many people here have, um, are, are came here because you want to install a hedgerow? Okay. And uh, how many of you are interested in um, more, uh, are in a rural environment where you're going to put your hedgerow? Okay, so you've got rural, and then the rest is a suburban or urban. How many urban dwellers, full-on urban dwellers? Okay. All right, and then um, and then suburban. I'm sure is the rest. So the opportunity, of course, is that you can utilize these principles and these methods no matter where you are. It'll just be the size that um, that you are utilizing. Uh, that you'll that will impact your design. So what I'd like for you to do is um, to do. I gave you graph paper, and what I'd like you to do is a bird's eye view of where you want to put your hedgerow. And if you don't have a hedgerow, just make one up. You know, I mean, uh, if you don't have a place where you want to put a hedgerow, just make it up. You know, like think about your parents' house or your a place that you love or wherever, and just think about um, where it would be. Yeah. Um, could you just speak to why a hedgerow? Well, we're going to get to that. Okay, oh, great. Of course, yes. So a hedgerow, so we're looking at a bird's eye view. I'm just working on getting you into the designer's mind. And thinking about everything that I'm sharing with you, how can you utilize that where you are living or where you potentially might want to design a hedgerow? So we all, anytime we do a design, we're documenting. So you always want to put your name, the date, your address or your location, and then uh, in this situation, you're going to say not to scale because we're not going to be going to that at this point. And the last thing that you always put on a document is where is north. So you put your north indicator because when you're designing, you want to know the sun's pattern. Okay. So you're going to do a rough sketch, bird's eye view of where did you want, and, and, and we're talking about canvas at this point. But this way you'll, you know, you'll, you'll kind of get going on thinking about the potential. Does everyone have paper? You all, you know, folks that just came in, you're, we've uh, broken up with maritime, arid, and, um, and temperate. Okay. All right, so quick little sketch. So this is a, an example of a, um, in the Willamette Valley, of a, uh, of what we normally see as hedges along waterways. So you've got, you know, you can just see the patterns here where the hedges are. Some are much thinner, some are thicker, and, um, and so we're just going to proceed with this. So the workshop, what we're going to be doing during this time is we're going to, I'm going to be defining what hedgerows are. And then um, uh, talking about designing your particular hedgerow, the functions of the hedgerow, plant selections, what uh, and where you'll be putting them in, showing examples of urban and uh, rural hedges, and then what, it, what does it take to install and maintain a hedge as well as some resources. So that's what you're going to be doing in the next hour. I think this is over at 11, right? Mm -hmm. And then 
our wonderful Brian, who works here on site, teaches permaculture courses. He is going to lead, uh, will co-facilitate the installation that is happening after this class. So, would you like to share what we're going to do? Yeah, so we've got some existing apple trees that were planted a long time ago, plum trees. We've been slowly turning them into forest gardens, and we need to keep the deer out. So we're going to be trying to put in a hedgerow that will eventually become a deer fence. And we can look at an example of a successful one, and then talk about the installation, the design of it, and then actually put some plants in the ground. So it'll be a lot of fun. And the weather's nice, so that's a splendid. Yeah. <laughs> So um, the person that just came in, if you want to get, there's some graph paper here, there's also two handouts, um, and we're just doing a quick little design. The graph paper, who has the we graph paper? The graph paper. There's a packet, there's a whole. We just came in. It's right here on the floor. Oh, yeah. And the second yeah. handout. The, the one second handout. The one without. Yeah, there's two handouts. Yeah, okay. One on permaculture basics, and then if anybody needs the um, handout for this particular workshop, they're here. Okay, so now we're just going to get rolling on, um, on uh, giving you a, a bit of a historical perspective of hedges. So this is in the UK, and um, how many people have been to the UK and saw the hedges in the UK? You're so lucky. <laughs> a friend of mine took this picture, and it's like, oh, I just really, I, it's one of my dreams. Um, the difference between the hedges that I'm going to talk about and the hedges that are often utilized in the UK um, and by farmers all around the world is they tend to be, the hedges tend to be a singular plant that just dots, you know, the, the, the hedge and that's about it. And what we're going to be talking about is the uh, the idea of a multi-species, uh, multi-species of plants that um, that you can incorporate in the hedge as well as products. So rows of trees, shrubs, low-growing plants, perennials, grasses, vines, um, anything that um, that um, that you would. Because I'm all about function, beauty, and function as a designer. How can we bring those together? So, um, but just a little bit of the historic perspective of hedges is that the um, in in the UK the hedge layers were one of the more respected um, occupations because that is a very bloody job because they used hawthorn. And um, a, a, a friend also took this picture, which is laying the hedge. So haga or hedge is derived from the word hawthorn because they would go out into the woods, go along the waterways, and they'd get live stakes. They'd cut live stakes and put them in the ground, and they would just put in a line of hawthorn. And so what they do is that they, and I hope you can see this color. This is the only color that's really here, is that they have... Um, a line of trees that they plant, and when they get to be like 10 feet tall, they take this, they take this hawthorn, they cut it, and then they lay it down, and they weave it within the hedge. And that's the picture that you're seeing, is they cut and they weave. And that creates an impenetrable fence, shall we say. It used to be when you read the history books about hedges, is they the idea was to keep the animals in and the marauders out. So that was the, the reason for laying this hedge, which creating fences. They also used sun hazel, whatever was in the. So yeah. instead of digging post holes, basically they let the tree root itself. They were using live plants. Yep. Yeah. Right. They plant the, they put it in the ground. Here's the you know the mm -hmm. ground level. Yep. And then the roots would grow, and then bingo bango. And just pop the tree. Yes. Yeah. We have an example of this we can look at with hawthorn here on the oh, site. Oh, awesome! So Great. You can check that out later. Okay, so multi-functional hedgerows for me is about you know any hedge. The, the, the definition of a hedgerow is that it is longer than it is wide. Simple. Longer than it is wide. And, um, and, and that can be in, utilized in any environment. In the urban environment, it's also often used in the front yard. 
creating a barrier for privacy. Uh, also, though, there's the opportunity for um, to be utilizing these hedges in a farm setting uh, for privacy or for, I'll get into the functions as we go along. So think of it as a linear food forest. That's not how I think of it. I, I, have, I have an agreed opinion. I'm not really a big fan of the term food forest because I think it's, uh, it's confusing. And I, and I, my main, um, as a landscape, I had a landscape business for many years and my focus was edible landscape design. So I think about hedgerows creating an edible landscape because that's what I want to do. Is I want to encourage as many functions as possible for the who's ever putting in their hedgerow. So that's basically what it is. And um, so as permaculturalists, we're thinking whole systems and as a farmer, you might be uh, inclined to you know, put the hedges on the outside uh, on your property edges. Or you might have them interfere, interfield. Um, and, and so another, another definition of permaculture could be providing strategies and tools to create sustainable land use. So there's many ways. Who, is, who are you talking to and how can they best understand the vocabulary words that you're using? <clears throat> so we start with the design process. And that's what those of you who have been doing some drawing, you are starting that design process because you've got your name, the date, the address, um, not to scale, and north. That's kind of where you begin as far as putting it on paper. Uh, and the other thing that I think about is, as we know, in permaculture, the first step is keen observation because you want to assess what is, what is the site telling you. Okay, where's the sun, the movement of the sun, how much rain do you get, what else, what else is important when you're doing a site analysis? Wind, what kind of soil, if there's water, where's the water table? Human and animal activity and paths. Animal activity, are you gonna put the hedgerow right in the path of the elk? No, maybe you're gonna put it so potentially so that they can go, they'll know to go around it. Or do you um, want to create rat and bunny habitat or not? Or not, that's exactly right. <laughs> what is it that you want to create in that environment? So you do, so you're observing, and then you're doing that site analysis, which we'll go into a little bit more. That site analysis will yield the design, and then you'll do an implementation, and then you'll go, oops, let's see, how did I do? This, did this implementation, I mean, did this make sense the way that I designed it? So you do this feedback, and you start all over again, because that's the process of uh, the design process, and, and really learning from your mistakes. That's one of my favorite principles in permaculture, and some of you might not have heard that one, but it is learn from your mistakes and that has been a gift to me throughout my whole career. So we want to think in the design process, it's called smart, specific, you know, to the site, measurable, is this working for you? Um, is it achievable? What I'm doing is, you know, are we going to plant a thousand plants out today in this little hedge that we're doing? No, we're going to plant maybe 20 plants. Um, so it's the same thing for you. Start with, if you're doing an, an urban, uh, hedgerow, you might start with 20 feet. If you're doing a rural hedgerow, you might start with 50 feet. The other permaculture principle that I hold very dear is to start small and have success. Because how many of us have put in a garden the size of this room and it looks gorgeous, the first rain comes, what happens? Weeds all over the place because there's an amazing weed seed bank and you can't, you can't keep up with it. But if you have a little garden, and it rains and the seeds co weeds come up, then you can maintain it. So I always recommend starting small, um, achievable, and that's the same thing, realistic, and then what kind of timing are you going to have as far as your design relative to implementation. Okay, so imagine you're designing a hedgerow. Oftentimes clients come to me because they're pulling their hair out because they don't know where to start. And uh, so, so we're going to just go through this process. Of course, this person's doing keen observation of the site. And then, um, you know, where would it be? So that's the first thing. So those of you who have written down where you want your hedgerow, you, you, can't, you have that idea. Um, what is it you want to achieve? What are the functions? Well, I'm going to be talking functions, 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 because that's what I see as a multifunctional hedgerow is. What, what is the size? Um, what are you going to plant? Uh, how are you going to maintain it? Who's going to maintain it? 
Um, that's the other thing. It's like, are you the kind of person, are you working 40 hours a week? On the weekends, you like to go hiking. Do you have a family of three or four kids and that you're, you know, you're busy with them all day? And you know, how much time do you have to take care of what it is you're designing? That's one of the key points in, um, in the design process. And then um, document, document, document. You'll hear me repeat that, that word quite a lot. And we're starting documentation right now with the opportunity to potentially utilize some of these ideas for your particular site. Okay? So then the next thing is the site analysis, which we've talked about a bit already. So uh, what is the climate? You know, I mean, that is the first, one of the first things that you need to be mindful of. Um, what is the soil, the soil structure? And we know out here it's a far soil and it's a very heavy clay. If you live near a waterway, then you're going to tend to have a more loamy soil. And so that's going to be very different of how you, you're planting, what plants you're going to be using. Um, the other thing is, um, is it waterlogged? I've done a lot of hedgerows along waterways, and that, it, you know, they're standing water from three days to three weeks. So what plants are going to work in that environment? So we're talking site-specific, you know, the topography, the accessibility. Can you, um, can, is it uh, accessible through your roads, or do you have to schlep all your stuff in the garden cart, and what are you going to, you know, how are you going to do that? Um, location, again, what are the conditions, the functions, they need to enhance biodiversity. That's my, that is one of the tenets in the way that I design, is bringing in as much diversity on the site as possible. And we'll talk about that in a lot more detail. Uh, as, uh, and then the size, we've addressed that. And then what are the existing conditions? How much rain do you get a year? Is it hot all summer? Uh, and, and you know no water in the summer and deluges in the winter like it is in the temperate northwest. Um, uh, the wind, what's the, what kind of what's the weed pressure? What's the wildlife pressure? Uh, and then what's the pollution? Sometimes people are designing hedges because they're on a busy street and they want to screen off the road and some of that pollution. Yes. How would you define what's the difference between maritime and temperate? Anybody want to define that? Temperate versus maritime? My guess on it would be salt in the air and mm -hmm. the big factor in wind. Yes. The salt's depending, but that could certainly be part of it. Wind could certainly be part of it. It's really about, well, oh, go ahead. Well, temperature swing. Temperature swing? Is like, what's the range of temperature day to night? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. um, Great. So temperatures so, and all, you know so location. So maritime would be closer swing, to the water. Much less swing. Less swing than yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Not much snow then. Not much snow. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Though I think we have had a little snow <laughs> last year. Um, so yeah, great question. Any other questions so far? Okay. So designing a hedgerow. These are the things that we're going to be including. And, and this is, might be where you're going to start writing on your paper. Um, so, you know, you might be thinking now, oh, when you came here, oh, I'm going to do a thousand foot hedgerow. Oh, well, now that I've been listening to you, maybe I want to do a hundred foot hedgerow. So start thinking about what is the sun? I think we have some recognition here. Um, so, so let's think about the size and your observing. One of the things that I learned because I teach a lot is that as humans, we tend to need to hear something six times before we, we remember it. Get that. So, <laughs> <laughs> right? Especially as we get a little older, that might be a hundred times. But um, so you can see me repeating some of the things that I, the key points that I think are really important in this slideshow. Okay, so the vision. Prioritize the functions that you want to achieve through your intro. So what are your functions? Uh, then you're going to be thinking about the design layout. Where is it that you want to put your specific plants? Time to maintain. Oops, that's the second time I've talked about maintenance because it's a big one. <laughs> yeah. And then the budget, establishing and maintaining your design, your plan. What is, how much do you have realistically? 
So you can buy. That also is a timeline thing, though. It's a timeline thing. That's right. Because you might want to, you know, you might uh, be able to go out and propagate in the forest, or um, from a friend, or you know, and just get little starts. Or you might go. I live in. I live in a suburban area, and I have. A neighbor that I really want to block, and I am going to go out there, and I'm going to get a five-gallon mm -hmm. plant so that mm -hmm. it will grow faster. Or also, the nursery every year has on sale at this specific time these trees, exactly. and I can only buy X number a year. Perfect. And so I know that. And what I've done in the past is just put stakes on the ground, writ the tree, that I mark with mm -hmm. different tags yeah. of where and when I'm yes. going to plant them according to when I have the money to do Perfect. it. Perfect. So that's that's a really good idea. So. I'm um, telling your name. I'm sorry. Christine. Christine just mentioned that she has a, a design in mind. She stakes where all the plants are and labels them, and she waits till this time of year to go out and get the sales. Or also or, the time of year where the sky is going to water it for me. Well, all the plants. Oh, that's a whole other thing about installation. <laughs> when, oh, yeah. what time of year? For sure. Yeah. So one of the budget factors that we've struggled with is um, water. If you're gonna, right. um, when you're doing an install, and again, depending on the time of year, um, are you planning for um, what it's gonna cost you year in year out to water this thing? If you're if you're putting in plants that are gonna require that's right, um, that's right. Annual, well, you certainly know, ongoing about water. That. Yep, installation and all of that. So then evaluating and implementing. So we're doing all of these. This is in our design, and then we're evaluating. Does this all make sense? And then we're going to implement. So those are the key points in the design process. And then, of course, we are observing. If it's not working out, we're adapting and we're advancing. We're changing it up. Because that plan is just because you can't handle being waterlogged. We thought it could, they said it could, but it's dying because it's got, it has too much water. So that way, we're adapting, advancing, and then we're going, we start all over again. Because it's, it's a continual process. I always say, designing is never done. Mm -hmm. So now we talk about one of my favorite parts about, but about hedgerows is the multifunctional aspect of it. So now we're going to talk about some of those functions. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to enhance biodiversity and encourage wildlife. We are, as you know, we are in a place where um, monocropping is, that's, you know, whether it's in the landscape environment or it's in the farming environment. We tend to have the same types of plants, and so, and that our our bees, of course, now we're, we can thank goodness that somebody is really pushing. I mean, it's a shame that the bees are dying, and that that's bringing our awareness. But I have never heard so much talk about bees and pollinator species in my life, and that, of course, is because it's just getting to be more dire. So what we can do is that we can bring more biodiversity to our land. And that can be in any kind of, it uh, doesn't have to be a hedgerow, it can be in anything. The other thing is encouraging insects for pollination, nectar, and beneficial insects. So biodiversity is not just the insect population, but it's everything. You know, it's the birds, and it's the snakes, and it's all the reptiles. Um, and when we're encouraging beneficial insects, that's for those pollinators to come in and creating those nectar sources. The next one is um, decreasing wind. So back in the 30s, you know, when there was the Dust Bowl, they had, um, they really got into planting windbreaks. And so a lot of hedgerows now, you know, when you think about windbreaks. So uh, another way of, when I think about hedgerows, I also talk about shelter belts and buffer zones. So the shelter belts is what's part of uh, decreasing the wind. Now, unfortunately, what happened is that in the 30s, they planted a whole bunch of hedges. And then in the 50s and 60s, when the chemical industry got really big, they took out the hedges. And what happened? More insect challenges. And then what happened? More, More chemicals. Hooray! So that's sort of the history around the, hedge, the hedgerow, why there's less hedgerows. Now people are back to planting more hedges. Uh, so, you know, the wind definitely helps with wind, and I'll show you slides with that. It increases nutrient uptake and erosion control, uh, conserves water, creates borders and privacy screens along property uh, borders and along roads, as well as reduces noise and other types of pollution. 
And then one of the things that is um, that I am very focused on is diversifying income. I work with a lot of farmers, and the idea of having a hedgerow that is multifunctional that will also provide income is something that I um, focus on a lot. And I'll share with you ideas for that income production in a little bit. And of course, hedges are beautiful as well. So these are just some of the functions of a multifunctional hedge. OK, so the designing. So um, you know, putting, your, that, putting it into action. So what we're looking at right now is we're looking at this multi-level. So we've got tall in the middle, medium, and then small. And um, oftentimes, the way I like to think about it or design it is that there's, you're putting the taller species in the middle. Um, and just as an aside, the research has shown that if you're wanting to encourage bird population, creating, uh, planting deciduous plants uh, is more effective. Because, with, especially in the wintertime, the birds will fly in and it will be easier for them to land on a plant that doesn't have leaves on it versus a conifer. So you could, so again, depending on what the function is for your particular hedgerow, um, and then thinking about how can you, you know, interplant to create this sense of diversity as well as, um, you know, including the functions that you want to have. So it can be three to five rows and, um, and a variety of species. And that's what we're looking for is variety of species in size and shapes, foliage, and function. And which is along the waterway. And then there's the upland types of hedges. And um, so this is like the upland. And then the riparian, you see there's this buffer zone. So you're, uh, so you're really working on, legally, you're not supposed to cut a, um, it's really 35 to 100 feet, but it, you, you need to have like um, at least a 35, bu 35 foot buffer zone along waterways, at least in Oregon. I'm not sure about Washington. Washington is 50 feet. In, in Washington it's 50 feet. At least, at least yeah. I don't know, it's county. It depends on the county. It depends on the county. Mm -hmm. For us it's, yeah. So anyway, so that would be like 50 to 35 feet planting a diverse uh, number of plants. And of course the plant species will be different. So, um, so this is a, a, a hedgerow that I did a long time ago for Winter Green Farm, and so the challenge was, or the interesting thing was, is um, working with the farmer. So, like, I'm, and I'm kind of sharing some of this in case some of you are consulting, you know, landscape designers and want to work with clients. Is like really getting a buy-in to do this hedgerow kinds of um, planting, and um, you know what species is going to work, you know, I might want to, I, I had a suggestion of like 25 species, and then they chose 10. So I want to have the buy-in of the client that I'm working with so that they will actually implement and care for the design. So, um, so what we did, we had, in this environment, we had bear, deer, elk, beaver, nutria, bulls, and mice. That's all? That's all. Right. So what we had to do is we had to use hardware cloth, which is um, a very strong galvanized metal. And I got a roll of three feet, and I went to a welder, and I had him cut off a foot on the bottom, or for, for the, um, a, a, a foot on this roll, and we placed a foot uh, of the, uh, the hardware cloth in the bottom of the hole. Mm -hmm. So here's the hole, here's the hardware cloth. And then the other three feet, or two feet, went onto the top. So we had that. We also, we started actually with having some landscape cloth on. That's what the client wanted. You know, you can use cardboard or, or whatever, um, newspaper. And then um, we had to, we used wire to uh, bring these together. Because what I want, because this was right along a waterway, and I knew the beaver going to wipe it out. And right after we planted, there was the beaver moved in. They just must have known. And we did not lose one plant to beaver damage, which is pretty miraculous. So we so we used rebar to stake these this this wire hardware cloth on. And then um, we got the, the plant in. And then so here's the plant and then we put a uh, plastic tube so that the mice would not eat the um, the tender bark. And what else did we do? Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So we created this 
amazing barrier that um, was very successful. So you've got to know who are the predators to eat those nice plants. Because you will waste so much time. A lot of people use chicken wire. You have to wrap it a lot. And then the other thing is, is you have to make sure that you release the tree it, as it grows. Yes. So the harbor cloth went a foot down, is that what you're saying? A foot down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why you just put a three foot piece in and then just put it a foot down oh, and keep it up? Because that's a really good question because mm -hmm. we wanted to create a barrier and it was easier for us to actually lay the cloth, oh, put see. this down, lay the barrier down, right. and right. then plug it in. Right. You know, but that would have been easier, but you know. Well, yes. and once the tree is established, you're not going to be able to remove that bottom part underground. That's right. That that's easy. right. But and it's big enough that the, the roots are very easy to. They just go through. They just there. push it through. Right. Yeah. 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 And I, we used uh, probably inch by inch hardware cloth. And there's all different kinds of sizes. That's big. So you definitely yeah, right? Oh, uh, no, we just did individual <laughs> plants. In, but this, this we did this on every single plant for, yeah, for, what, for, for all these critters. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a big guys. investment. It's a huge investment. Yeah. And then, <laughs> just on the side, I had a volunteer group from the Northwest Youth Corps, young, a bunch of young people who, um, you know, because we're trying to bring community involved, and it was the first sunny day in, like, you know, in in spring, and so it was a uh, it was it was a challenge <laughs> to get all of this squared away. It was, but we did it, and um, and it worked. So there we go. So this is it. Um, quite a few years later, probably six years later. So we had persimmon, elderberry, sea buckthorn, gumi, aronia, and chestnut in that particular. Okay, so wildlife corridors. Um, you know, you've talked a bit about that, so you kind of have a sense of, you know, I, I love to think about the, that the wildlife and the waterways are wildlife corridors are like a highway. And so, um, you know, one of the things that's really important when you're thinking about hedges and uh, movement and you're wanting to encourage wildlife is that you, um, you want to make it so that, the, um, so that there's enough, enough room so like you might be planting in this environment, but also so that the critters can move from safe place to safe place, you know, in that, uh, in that sheltered area, in that buffer zone. Anyway, wildlife, windbreaks. So I'll talk a bit about windbreaks. How many people here are challenged with wind and are really interested in creating um, hedgerows for windbreaks? So not a whole lot. Okay. So if you are, you know, this, these are some key points for you. So, so you have to think about, um, you know, the effect on the crop. It's a, it decreases heavy wind will decrease crop production. Bottom line, it will. Um, um, uh, you know, the, the windbreaks animal, the, the other thing is that's really great to have um, for, for windbreaks that's encouraging is for animals because they will produce more and be happier if they're protected from the wind as of course will the crops as well. And then there's stability of the soil. It will lessen soil movement. So that's some of why we want to create windbreaks. So as an example, no windbreak, there's soil moisture and heat loss. There's water loss, so there's, you know, um, cows are not as happy, they don't eat as much because it's so windy, um, and the house needs more firewood to keep it warmer, or you warmer, or one warmer. So if you are planting a hedge, um, so you see prevailing winds coming from this direction, it increases plant production, there, the soil is protected, the dam is protected, the cow is happier, um, there's more moisture in the soil, uh, and then you can save 30% um, on your fuel costs by having wind protection. Do you have any general formula about how tall does the break have to be and what? Yes, I can describe that to you. Um, okay, so as an example, you can, um, so the formula of the research that I have read is that if you have a tree that is um, 50 feet tall, it will protect an area up to 500 feet. Now this is just on average, it's really great because I'm math impaired, so this formula is very helpful to me. And that just goes all the way down to, so a 40-foot tree, 
So, um, so if it's a 40 foot tree, it protects an area up to 400 feet and so on. I have designed four foot hedges, you know, in a farm situation where, you know, it's protected. So you, if you thought, if you've got a lot of wind and you are, you need a hundred foot, a thousand foot seal, you're going to want to put a 50 foot tree as your main tree every 500 feet. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because otherwise, you know, it would go down. Does that make sense? Okay. So, uh, the permeability, like what happens when you have a solid fence and you have strong wind? It blows down. Exactly. So you want permeability to be, um, I've heard different, different ratios, but about 40% permeability. So open space, 40%. Um, so that, so that the, um, so that the wind will channel properly. So, you know, this just gives you another example of the prevailing wind, the impact on dust and soil and all of that. So 40% permeability is what we're talking about. And that, and you get that through the different levels, different sizes. How, how is that measured, 40%? I mean, I'm just trying to... It's on, it's on average, because you can, you can kind of look like, like if something's 100% mm -hmm. impermeable. Oh, I, I totally get okay. how you can tell if it's 100%. Scientific. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of a hedgerow that I have <laughs> on our property that um, are, you know, it was overplanted. Right. Um, Initially, and but it's matured, and um, they're, tr they're just trees. Well, they're not just, but in any case, and um, and I think so they're too tell, dense. Well, but how do look, I know if they're too you dense? You can look through it for one thing. Can you see through it? If you can't see through it, then it's not as permeable. Uh huh. Um, that would be the first thing. And you know, how do you know? Well, the scientists have come up with this formula. Right. No, I know. But, I understand. Um, I mean, you can I tell the trees are blowing it. down, but. Yeah, you know, and I would just it, look through it and see if it's if you know okay. if you've got uh -huh. some open space, and especially like if you have winter wind, right? And you've got deciduous, then that's opening up. That well, oh no, I totally get that. No, this okay. is an evergreen hedge. Okay. Yeah, and it might be too. It, you might need to have somebody come in and really thin it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, the height. We talked a bit about the height. Um, the oops, the the higher the wind. Uh, break the greater the zone of protection, as we talked here. Um, and then here it just gives you another example. If, if an open wind is 35 miles per hour, the, the wind break can reduce velocity up to 10 miles per hour. I mean, that's pretty significant. So again, you're keeping your house warmer, as an example. So, and that's, you know, 15, uh, 10 here, higher up, and then 15 when it gets closer to here. So it's just kind of reducing your mind on that one. So the length, this, this is another interesting thing, and there's, there's really differing opinions on this, um, but you know, doubling the length of a wind break can increase the protected area up to four times. So what they're saying is they want it a, a lot longer than you think that you need, right? So because you want the wind to funnel around, because if it's shorter, it's going to funnel around and hit right what you're trying to protect. And it might not be a wind coming from true north or northwest exactly. or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So the wind is a you know it's a whole other way of you know, you know the width again you know more than three times its expected final height is another formula. I'm giving you lots of formulas and again you know I'm all about like just getting it in the ground and thinking about all of this. But you know if I have a lot of wind then I'll be working with the formulas much more. Okay. Um, the other thing is, you know, uh, you could uh, be angling, you know, orientation can, you know, angle. So uh, one thing is if you have, uh, like your, your house is here, and you have strong winds coming from this direction, you'll want to have your driveway go at an angle. So it's not creating, or even a meander, so it's not creating this huge tunnel, which is like increasing the volume of the wind. Okay. Okay. So that's the wind part. Any questions on wind? Yes. Um, so we have about two thousand feet of on the north side of our property that we're going to be doing a wind protection. It comes from the north uh, east or northwest. 
Um, some of the strategy for us, we can't just move this thing around. It's just the way we plant the trees so that they're kind of any tree behind the or leading tree would be in the direction of the wind. Mm -hmm. that, would that be a, kind of a way to... You want it perpendicular that? to the wind. Right. So we have this row here that we're doing planting, mm -hmm. and the wind is coming from this direction. Mm -hmm. So if we planted the second or third, we planted so that it breaks the... It doesn't have a space to get. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so right plant, right place. How many people here are plant people? Yes. Talk to the puppy. <laughs> so there's a bazillion, there's so many plants out there. And that's the, that is the thing that can be uh, confounding around plants. The thing is, is that I always address the right plant for the right place. And how do you know what the right plant for the right place is? What's the answer to that? Observation. Huh? Observation. Observation? And trial and error. Well, research. No, no, observation. <laughs> making the best decision. Yeah, thinking research. it's the best decision. Yeah. I know. And then, and then, and then a year later going, damn, I'm I really know. Wrong and I'm hoping that we can guide you through the process so that I have moved so many plants around in my life that I really like to work on getting that right plan in the right place. And you can do that by really um, making some strong assessments. So right now we have we know we've got trees and shrubs and vines and grasses and perennials and biennial and annuals and herbs and all these wonderful types of plants that you can include within the landscape. Now, what do those plants need? All of them need the same set of things. Is it hardy for your zone? Are we going to be putting citrus out in a temperate environment at 800 feet? <laughs> exactly. So hardiness, know about your hardiness. So the hardiness has changed. So we're about seven now. Since I've been in this business, it's gone from six to seven. It's warmed up that much. Mm -hmm. Pretty crazy, 35 years or so. Um, light, is it sun? Is it shade? So hugely important. A plant is not going to be happy if it's planted in the shade and it needs sun. So, and sometimes they can handle part sun. The soil type. Is it heavy clay or is it loam? Um, how much moisture does it get? So that, you know, if it gets a lot of moisture and the soil type is clay, we know we're going to have heavy body soil. So we not, we can, there's a lot of plants that are not happy in that environment. Um, what kind of drainage is there for that, uh, um, um, for that in that particular area? Um, what, how much uh, a plant at maturity, the size at maturity? So many people over plant because they've got this little, little bitty plant in a four inch pot okay. and it gets this, you know, four feet across. Mm -hmm. We're all guilty of that. Or we plant a fir tree two feet from the house mm -hmm. it's in this little pot. So I'm here to encourage you to think about the plant at the size of the tree. And the thing that's interesting is you can look at the labels mm -hmm. at the nursery and especially for our gorgeous maritime environment, they don't say, oh, it gets six feet by six feet plan for it to get 10 feet by 10 feet, because that's just what happens. So people, I call them filler plants, so I have a bunch of different like perennial, uh, like hardy geraniums, like if I'm planting an area, or, or oregano, or something that grows really fast, and there's a client that's, you know, the idea of having a lot of space between a plant until that plant matures is really Really challenging. Like I learned that when I, when one of my clients, like we got all the plants planted, and then she kept coming with her station wagon full of plants because she wanted to infill. Mm -hmm. And I was like, ooh, I stepped back and realized that she's going to have some serious work to do once all everything gets big. So I just encourage you to be mindful of plants with the size of maturity. Um, is it heat and wind tolerant? Are you going to put it on this, uh, a plant on the you know, where it's super hot and it can handle that, and then compatibility. What, um, what plants have to go with what thing? So that's some of the characteristics that you'll want to think about when designing. Um, just to speak to the plant size at maturity, I work for a nursery, and the owner of the nursery is very reticent to actually publicize how tall the trees get at maturity because he's afraid he's going to scare people away from buying them because people will perceive that they get too big. 
So I really recommend. <laughs> well, you mean they'll find I, out I, uh, that it's going to grow. That it's going to be 40 feet tall, right? Anyway, and, so. and so I encourage everybody to really do online research quite a bit in areas that have the same kind of climate that you have, especially for trees, so that you really get a sense of the variety that you're looking at. How big is it going to get? And your key, a key word is the variety. The variety. Because yes. Yes. In it addition does. to the size, a lot of people forget. It's not just we think about size of what we're looking at, where their roots go. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're planting near a septic field, for example, and you're planting a tree that will end up being about 40 feet tall, you have to plant it 40 feet from your septic field. Yeah. yeah. So. That's a it's really the good underground yeah. issue that the big yeah. too. It's really good. Yield. So this comes back to our functions. Food, fragrance, beauty, mulch makers, nitrogen fixers, nutrient accumulators, pollinizers, uh, beneficial insect attractors, pest repellents, wildlife attractors, shelter beds. So these are some of the jobs that plants. Uh, one of my favorite plants, I just kind of throw it, is a gumi multiflora, sweet scarlet. Mm -hmm. um, kind of a sweet, tart kind of uh, flavor, I may jam out of it if I can get it before the birds get it. It's a great shrub for a, for a hedgerow. Okay, so, um, so just another example to show you that, you know, this is what a, a, a nice hedgerow can look like, just kind of low in the, on each side and higher in the middle. Could I? And, and then planting hedges along the waterway. Mm -hmm. So I've got a much longer than it is wide space that backs onto a fence. Right. So I'm assuming that it would just go straight up and that the tallest things would be closest to the fence, even though they exactly. need the root yep. Um, yep, yep. capacity. I wouldn't say straight. I would say I would, I would have it go low and then, and then the tall yep. would be by the fence. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So uh, another favorite plant is the black elderberry. It's excellent for antioxidants. I make tinctures out of it. I made cordial out of it. Um, <coughs> uh, it's great for wildlife and beneficial insects. And it's a native plant as well as there's a specific varietal. So um, persimmon uh, stays on the tree until it's frost. I think that persimmons are definitely underplanted in this environment. It can handle wet feet up to three days. And then, you know, if you have not had a dried persimmon, it is exquisite. And it's just a beautiful plant as well. So, some examples of that. Uh, beneficial insect attracting. We certainly want to encourage beneficial insects during this process. Um, Alyssa um, I, um, is a really underutilized plant, especially for farmers. Um, they're, they're starting to plant hedgerows of Alyssa, basically, for increasing <coughs> insects. Mm. Um, so it includes, you know, of course pollination is huge and it produces better, you get better fruit, more quality fruit size, um, enhances wildlife biodiversity and plant biodiversity. Um, the thing that is most important in this particular slide, I think, is when you think about the size, if you have 40 acres, like I'm working, like I said, with large hop growers, with large vineyards, um, like 500 acres, 1,000 acres, and biodiversity is part of our plan, and that if we have 0.05 um, acres for every 40 acres of biodiversity, that has proven to be enough to bring in enough beneficial insects. Mm -hmm. Not that they're not having to spray, but they're spraying less. Mm -hmm. And I work with a lot of um, non-organic farmers by choice so that I can guide the process to spray less. Um, so you want to make sure that you plant early, mid, and late so that there's something always going on for those lovely insects to be eating. Uh, encouraging native bees, another like mason bees, another option that you can include in your hedgerow, just tacking them up. So it's not, so what I'm saying is that we're not just talking about plants, you're creating multifunctional. So, I, and I'm, I'm showing you this chart because it's readily available. This is one where people say, well, how do I know what's plant, you know, what to plant when? And you know they have lots of charts of what you know, so that you can have bloom pretty much most of the year. Okay, so now let's go back to your 
graphics, your work that you're doing. So let's, so I would like to have three, what are three plants that you could plant in your hedgerow, in a maritime environment? Three plants. Eliagnus, I mean, guys. So Eliagnus, you want on the model? Hawthorne, you could do. Let's say besides Hawthorne. I'm curious about Osage Orange. Osage Orange, I have some of that planted, and I'm not sure. A friend of mine propagated it, who lives from the Midwest, mm -hmm. and I'm curious how it's going to do. Mm -hmm. I have it in pots. I'm going to plant it this fall. Yeah, we're in the same situation. It grew yeah. very well in the pots, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's worth a try. Yeah. Very thorny. Osage Orange, Hazel yeah. really thorny. Huh? Hazelnut. Hazelnut mm -hmm. would be great. Excellent. What about in the arid environment? You own arid person. What can you what can you put in your what can what can be put in an arid environment? Sagebrush. 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 Yeah. Where do you live? Uh, east of uh, east. Um, no, we're we're looking to uh, go to New Mexico and we oh, live sometime okay. in the uh, um, mm -hmm. Rio Chama, Rio Grande area. Right. So um, mesquite. Yeah. You could do mesquite, oh, which is really good for which beneficial. Is it yeah. mesquite? Mesquite, yeah. There's yeah. also um, the sage uh, brushes with grouse. I don't know if they have grouse down there, but they're really trying to do a lot of uh, sagebrush for right. yeah. bringing the grouse yeah. in. What about the pine? The desert pine. Desert yeah, pine would be good. Any, anything else? Would sea buckthorn yeah. do well? Yeah. The manzanita? Yeah. In the, I don't know. It'll be too hot. Yeah. Yeah. Might get down on the elevation. A little hot, yeah. 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 So anyway, yeah. That, and then what about uh, temperate? Chestnut. Woo. Chestnuts are great. Yeah. Really yeah. watch for mice on chestnuts. Love mice love the bark of chestnuts. It's yeah. very sweet. Some yeah. better? Something? Cianothus. Cianothus is good. Huh? Back locust would be fine. Nine bark is good. Spirea, all those things are great. We have such an abundance of mm -hmm. So if somebody, if you want to just make a note of some things on your, on your design right now, let's just take, let's just take thirty seconds. By make them beautiful. It'd be perfect. Yeah. Why not? Red butter is good. It's a nitrogen fixer and it um, can grow fine. Yeah. Did you want yeah. Okay. So a couple of examples. This is Leonard Farm. He's one of the few farmers that I have um, worked with that does a good in his farm. And it's really amazing. Where are they? Uh, they are in Washington, Eastern Washington. Yeah. yeah. So as you can see, it's mm -hmm. very arid. But yet, yeah, he's got amazing. Uh, you know, he's been really working to encourage the um, the um, uh, diversity. Okay. So income production. That's that's. I uh, wanted to uh, make sure we have time to talk a bit about that. So all kinds from the plant. You've got the leaves, berries, nuts, roots, fungal. Um, honey for high products, um, wood for fuel, chip logs for bedding and mulch. So, um, and, and you can also like coppice. So, you know, regeneration of craft materials. So craft materials is another function, uh, such as willow, uh, culinary herbs and medicinal herbs, leaves, roots, barks, and seeds of those. Floral materials, sword fern, salal, willow, twinberry. Propagation, we've got seeds, uh, rootstock, cuttings, transplant, um, carbon sequestration, uh, getting credits for carbon sequestration. So um, building materials such as bamboo, fence posts like from the black locust, charcoal, dye plants, uh, food for wildlife, game birds. The opportunity for providing income from your hedgerow is, I wouldn't say, it, you know, there's an abundance of opportunities for that. And so you think about what is it that you're interested in. Like a lot of people now are you do, including medicinal herbs because that's the big thing for tincture. But um, the floral, I mean, just incredible. Anything else that people can think of? Other income? Yes. I'm really interested if you've ever seen anyone do nursery stock. You can do nursery stock as part of that propagation, yes. Um, and, and that is, it's like, I'm always propagating, like all my perennials and my like, but fig tree is really easy to propagate, and and you know, and apple trees, and and, and it's it's just planning for that particular purpose. Yeah, I'd be glad to talk about that more. Mm -hmm. So um, alley cropping is another way of just thinking about the potential of a hedgerow. Um, you know, it's um, you can increase ink. So uh, planting of trees and shrubs, 
in single or multiple layers that uh, with wide spacing, uh, and it can be a companion crop for existing crops that are on your site. So alley hopping. Again, you can do income production, diversification, and all the things we've talked about. Um, so you know, this is an example of um, greens growing in between uh, walnut trees. And this one is, I, I, this is Peter Kennedy. He is an amazing farmer up near Albany. And his mom was running for commissioner. And so he had all these plastic signs. <laughs> and he planted, this is all, these are all um, <laughs> uh, 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 walnut trees, black walnut. And that he, because he, has a deer, he had deer challenges, he, he used that. And then this was uh, 15 years later, or 20 years later, wow. that same area, right? He's planting those trees for his grandchildren's, yeah. Is this for lumber or for, for uh, looks like it might be for lumber? He is using it for lumber, yep. Yeah. He's going to be, he'll be selling it for lumber. Yeah, mm -hmm. for wow. For wow. beautiful flooring and all of that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So even in the big island, in the tropics, you're going to be, still be using, you know, the hedgerows are still, you know, you can use them anywhere in the world. Um, alder is another awesome plant that to be included in the hedgerow. It's a, the leaves are really good for nitrogen fix. Um, animal fodder, firewood, crafts. Um, willow, again, another craft. The red twig is, is really nice for crafts, so that too could be included. And well, and propagation of that, oh, it's so easy. Mm -hmm. Stalinifera, so it goes by stall uh, underground. Water. And it likes water, so there you go. Black locust, you might have heard of. Um, really good for fence posts, a very hard wood. You just have to be careful where you put it because <laughs> it can be invasive. Yeah. So you've got, you know, that's the other thing is what are the repercussions, especially if you're doing a border along uh, somebody else's property. Or if you want to keep diversity. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so saving seeds is another part of propagation that can happen in a, um, a hedgerow plant. And then saving those, this is a, a, one of our seed swaps in Eugene. Okay, other things that you can put in a hedgerow are um, mushrooms. These are oyster mushrooms. I, this is an alder tree, and, um, and I created a little spiral where we did, um, we put the spawn on there, and then here's a little spiral alder. Uh, and it's in a hedgerow. I just like put that in part of my hedgerow. And then, of course, you get this beautiful Lerotus, um oyster mushrooms that are great and all kinds of cooking. The options, you know, many options. So implementation, you know, how, okay, so that's a lot of information on the design, the types of plants. You know, getting the, the soil prepared is really one of your most important things because of the seed bank that's in the um, in the soil. So you know again we want to think about the budget, what it's actually going to cost and your timeline. I like to start if you're working in a farm environment, I recommend um, and you have a tractor and you have a tiller or whatever and I'm not a big I in the garden I don't tend to till but if you're doing a long hedgerow I recommend working that soil up in the spring, letting it rain, let the, the all the weeds come up, working it up again letting the seeds come up, plant a cover crop, and then in the fall, do your planting for your hedgerow. That's the sequence that I recommend. Uh, and then during that time, when you're thinking, you'll think about the plant selection, of course, what it is that you want to do. Do you need fencing? Because that's, again, you're going to have to budget that in and think about the maintenance uh, relative to that. Uh, who is going to water it? How is it going to be watered? And weed control? And then, and, you know, evaluation, monitoring, and document, 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 so that you learn from your mistakes. Yeah, exactly. I do have a suggestion. I mean, you can till and all of that, too. But this is also time management. If you know that this is something that you want to do at some point down the line, sheet mulch it. Just sheet you mulch these totally swaths sheet. of areas, Absolutely. and they're, they're just going to sit there, and the worms yep. are going to love them. They're going to do the tilling yep. for you. Perfect. So like and if you can seriously do it two years out, Absolutely. even you could do it one year out. You could do it one season out. Absolutely. Yep. And then you're really taking away from the whole weeds coming up because when you're digging your rice, you're digging a direct hole. Mm -hmm. So sheet mulching is a great example for... And it's for great. I mean, you can use any material. It's, just, it's, a, it's a more challenging when you're doing a lot you know, trees, but, but in town... Again, if you have a field that you're whacking down yeah. or whatever, just... Take your cardboard, your newspaper, anything you have, yep. lay it out, and just throw that yep. on it. 
The they song, the, hey, the song you matter. Matter. Of, of it, And yeah. it'll just go away, you yeah. know? It's perfect. That's what I usually do. For in just town. letting time work for us. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Nature. Yeah. So this was um, this is parking lot national, and they did Oregon grape, and this is and this is arid, really. Um, ash, chokeberry, Oregon grape, vine maple, Douglas Vilea, and connecting right there, in, on the main road, the parking area. So I like the idea of creating these kinds of plantings for low maintenance, basically. Yeah. Okay, tree protection. We talked a bit about that. You know, tubes is a really important part if you're going to have a challenge. Um, and there's lots of things that you can use. You can use paper, and you saw the different um, other options. Mulching, this is kind of going back to, you know, sheet mulching, um, you know, using straw, local straw is great. Don't use hay, it has seeds, but use straw. This person, um, Lenwood, Brian used landscape cloth because that he had, you know, he's doing thousands and thousands of feet and this works best for him. And it's theoretically biodegradable. I'm not too sure about that. Um, bark mulch works really good. And you want to just make sure that you're not burying the crown of the plant when you, when you mulch. But the idea of sheet mulching is so great because you can uh, have, you're already building that bank of delicious soil and good till. So urban hedges, you know, just whatever really works for you. You know, this is some viburnum. Um, uh, opulus that's blooming, um, you know, how, depends on how dense it is and what it is that you're trying to achieve. This is just a simple, uh, some dwarf fruit trees with strawberries planted underneath just to create a little separation of the driveway. So, you know, in the urban environment, you know, here's grapes creating a little hedgerow with straw, with um, <coughs> herbs and daylilies. Daylilies, thank you. Um, so there's you know, you can produce some income, there's soil conditioners, there's great privacy. Um, and then where the ducks are, they just have this little hedge of, um, I think it's uh, it's a, a evergreen honeysuckle. But so, and, and they can be of all sizes, all sizes, and, and they have their functions. Um, this was where I used to live, and this was on either side of the driveway. Um, you know, we've got Rose Champion or Lickness, there was a Smoomac that was already there, Bamboo is a great, uh, as long as you're willing to propagate that, <laughs> because it can run, what variety of bamboo are you using? There was an apple, there was a tall walnut, there was a box elder, so, so all of these different plants were brought together to create a living hedge. So maintenance. Choose for the care and ease of, for your particular situation. I recommend irrigating for the first three years. First three years. Some people don't do it. You're going to plant, plant in the fall. We're talking five gallons a week for per tree at it's least. It's a lot of water, depending on your water table and how much water you get. You can go through all of this, and they're going to die because you're not giving them water. So that's part of that maintenance situation. I do know people, a friend of mine, plants along the water's edge, he never irrigates. And he's, his success rate is 70%. And swales. Mm -hmm. You could plant. And, and even gardens. Down. So I had somebody, uh, I actually it was David Auburn, mentioned running a, renting a trencher. Yep. And the trencher puts everything on one side. It's not a lovely thing. So mm -hmm. you can easily make a, in a garden on a small scale mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. I, so how are you going to keep the weeds down? Them. What kind of barriers are you going to use? Um, assessing, you know, the insects, what challenges you might have around that. And then, of course, you want to document what plants did you put where, when did you put them in, how are they doing. Because you want to replicate this more often than not. And where do you get the nursery stock? Again, your budget. Are you going to get a five-gallon container? Are you going to get a bare root? Bare root is definitely less expensive. And, um, you know, a lot of times it's available in the spring, so you want to get it early, February. Look at, start looking for plants January, February, for sure. And then irrigating, there's a lot of different ways, and that's a whole other talk, is irrigation. So, the permaculture principles, I'm just about ready to wrap up, is I think of every single one of these principles is applied to a hedgerow design and implementation. We're getting yield, you know, it's relative location, it's like, you know, how close is it to where you want that hit to be as far as privacy and that sort of thing. There's many functions. I mean, you just go on and on. Why do I love permaculture? Because 
There's so many ways it can be applied in anything that you do. So resources, and you have resources on your handout. So there's just some examples. Um, um, income production. This, this is all on your handout. So, so the take home for me, and I'm hoping for you as well, is doing a keen observation for your site analysis. Um, assess the multiple functions that you want to have for your site. Making sure that you're planting the right place, right plant in the right place. What is the role of biodiversity in a hedgerow planting? Starting small, have success, and then document because information is. Okay. Any questions? Yes. If you had a couple of favorite resources to share, um, as far as you mean books. <laughs> what were your absolute favorites? This is an amazing landscaping for wildlife in the Pacific Northwest by Russell Lake. It is a very underutilized book right here. I think I think it's really good. I have a I have a you can go to my website, which is on my inform, um, on the sheet, and I have um, I wrote in ninety eight I think a bulletin a um, publication for OSU Oregon State University that tells you how to design and do a whole, and with a great plant list. This winter, I am going to re-up that. I'm going to re-update uh, it. And then I've been working on a book for almost as long on Hedro. So someday, I'll have a stack of books when I can't this up. But yeah. I think that, again, you want to think about the functions. You know, um, I really like Kojar's book, The Plants of the Pacific Northwest. Anybody else have recommendations oh. of books that you love? Um, well, I have a different question. Huh? I need to go back one oh. for a sec. This not this one. This one. Okay. Income production. Yes. Anybody want to take a picture of this? Was there another question? Yes. What are I do. What I didn't hear you mention mm -hmm. that I'm curious about is in a new planting situation using cover crops as mm -hmm. a way to, um, I mean you talked a little bit about the oregano and other things to sort of do the fill, because mm -hmm. I more saw you doing mulching or right. other kinds of things. So I just, I don't know if you want to comment more about that or that selection. Or for the infill? You mean? Yeah, for the, for the infill. Uh, I just, I go with whatever's fast growing that I can find from whomever, so I'm not spending money on it. And I do a lot of perennials for infill mm -hmm. and cover crop. Like crimson clover, right. I just sprinkle crimson clover that. in between. Yeah. In the summertime, I'll do buckwheat. Yeah. Yeah. For folks who aren't super plant geeks, Toby Hemingway's Gaia's Garden uh, oh, yes. it has an amazing table at the end of the book that not only gives you information, plant names and information about them, but he actually goes into the functions of the plants within your system. So yeah. you don't have to be a super plant geek to put together really <laughs> active functional groupings. Great. So that's a great suggestion. Okay, so um, we're about out of time. And I'm hoping that if you connected with somebody from your bioregion, you might want to get their name and number and communicate with them and maybe help each other do an install. All right, thanks for coming. Thank you.